Welcome back and in this video we're going to take a look at operating system interfaces. So first things first, what is user interface? So a user interface is a way of us as humans interacting with the computer and providing us with information. So the operating system provides this. So there's quite a lot of types of interface but for the CIE IGCSE you need to know about GUIs and CLIs. For other exam boards you need to know about voice, touch, menu driven, things like that. I'm going to cover them all but mainly GUI and CLI. So first things first, GUI stands for Graphical User Interface, which is a combination of windows, icons, menus, and pointing devices. Now, in fact, I'd probably say, I'd probably even go on with here and say 100% of interfaces you'll have used will be GUI, because intuitive is easier to use. Now, this is because they use icons such as the save icon which hides all complicated things you might have to do so imagine if you have to do all this typed out like maybe you have to type in save save as or whatever and you have to type all these commands out it gets rid of all the complexity by letting you just press a button so the way you can identify if it's a GUI if it's got windows icons menus or pointers or that it's a wimp just like me so let's think about windows so a window is a movable, resizable area inside the main display. So the operating system provides the desktop and the background and everything like that, and the windows are the things that are on top of that. Now, the operating system needs to make sure that the correct window gets the correct messages and it needs to actually understand which one's active and which one's not active. So if you, so if I'm looking at this one here and I click on, if I clicked here, it would open PowerPoint. It would bring that to the front, put this to the back, and all my commands will go to that window. Now, if you're not clicked on any of them, then sometimes it depends on the operating system, but if I clicked on the bottom of the taskbar, maybe, it would start doing commands to the operating system or desktop. So if I clicked Alt F4, for example, and I clicked on the taskbar, it would try and shut down the computer rather than close the current window. So the operating system's got to keep track of what's active and what's not active. So icons. So these are just small images that give you sort of like an idea of what things are. So I think about the save icon, that's a floppy disk. Now a floppy disk was one of the first means of storing data, especially if you want to go from place to place. So it's that stuck there, and even though you don't use it anymore, everyone knows that a floppy disk is the save icon. Same if you want to colour something in, we know that the paint bucket tool means it's going to fill a colour in, because it's in Microsoft Paint, it's in the, all the offices, it's, all, it's quite a universal symbol. Now, menus is essentially just a list of things you can do. So if you click file, you get a menu of things. If I right click like I have here, it gives me format, shape, text effects, comments, this is in PowerPoint at the moment, and it shows all the things that I can currently do. If I right click in this one now, you see it gives me all the related functions that I can do. So next slide, previous slide, presenter view, pointer options, things like that. So it's a little pop-up that gives you additional things you can do. And then we've got pointers. Now this is just your mouse or mouse-like device. It could be something else as well. I mean, I know a lot of people like to change the arrow to something different as well, but it's a way of allowing you to one, see where your mouse is positioned and allow you to interact with the system. So I'm just going to show you a quick demonstration of how we use a graphical user interface. So you can see here, I've got my desktop, which is obviously the graphical user interface. I've got obviously all these icons at the bottom of things I'm doing. I've got icons that we know what each thing is. I've got menus so I can change how big my icons are or I can sort them by size or name or whatever it is I want. So it's a graphical interface. I can work things out based on like what I'm used to. So that's why um, if I install a new program completely or when I was using Microsoft Word 365 for the first time I haven't used 365 ever, I can work things out if it's intuitive. You can look and go, right, that's a save icon. I go, right, that must mean that this is going to close something. If you switch to um, something like Linux, that is completely different to Windows, but there are still similarities. If you go onto a Mac, it's different, but there are similarities. A graphical interface allows us all to be, to use different interfaces and different programs but still manage to get to grips with it without having to read a big manual. If I went onto a Mac right now, would I be as fast as I am on Windows? No, I wouldn't. If I went and bought an iPhone tomorrow, I use 
an Android phone, so would I be as fast? Am I as good, good on an Android uh, uh, iOS phone as I am on an Android phone? No, I wouldn't be. But I'd still be able to work my way around it and still be able to work things out. Now, a quick summary of the GUI. So the benefits. It's intuitive, which means it's easy to use. It's easy to navigate. It uses Windows icons, menus and pointers. There's no complicated commands and you can easily switch data between different software. So for example, if I wanted to load a picture up into PowerPoint, I could drag that from Windows Explorer into the PowerPoint and that would work absolutely fine. So if I decide, let's go. Here, and let's say I want this definition here. That's like the will of this picture of a handshake. Drag this in to our PowerPoint. It's put the picture on there. Okay, I've not gone into that picture, I've just dragged it in. So we can switch data between applications relatively easily. Now the drawbacks, it requires a lot more memory than a CLI, which we're going to talk about in a bit. But if you've got to process lots of pictures, that takes up more memory, it's more instructions, therefore more RAM is needed. Windows 10, for example, needs a minimum of four gigabytes of RAM. So if your laptop or computer only has four gigabytes of RAM, then you're not going to be able to do much more your computer's going to struggle quite a lot more than, say, mine, which has got 8 gigabytes, so I've got 4 spare. Now, it probably not in regards to like, anything you're going to notice, but it will use a lot more processing power to, to display all these pictures, to you know, do all the background instructions that we think one click is one thing. So if you press save, and actually it's doing lots of different things. Now, especially if you're on like, an older style laptop or it's more uh, let's say it's more of a specialised, it's often like a Raspberry Pi. A Raspberry Pi, especially the first edition ones, so that's a really small computer, it's much faster to use the command line interface than use the GUI because it can be quite slow and laggy because it's got to process more. And it also takes a lot more space on your hard disk. So the next one we've got CLI, so the command line interface. So this is based on typing in commands and doesn't require a mouse. Now, you can use it on pretty much all computers. Even Android phones can get on a command on a line interface. And it's not really the main thing we use to interact now, and that's because it's a lot harder to use, and if you get something wrong, then it's not gonna work. So to use command line interface, you've got to know all of the commands. So you need to know where all your folders are, you need to know where everything is, where things are stored, how things work. Now it's built for people who know what they're doing. They get expert people, uh, network technicians, programmers, things like that. And they can quickly go ahead and do commands that maybe a novice user wouldn't quite know how to do. Now a quick demonstration on using the CLI. So when using a command line interface, now let's imagine, oh, I'm currently using command prompts, so let's imagine that when you turn your computer on, this is all you've got. So we're talking, this is really, really old computers compared to what you use now. Now, I can currently see that I'm currently in C, users, Reese Drury. Now, what you can do in a command prompt is you can use these commands. So let's, we're running for the clock back, we're back in like the 80s. If I want to see what documents I've currently got, I would type in DIR, which stands for directory. I press that, it tells me that I'm in drive C and it says all the folders I've got. So let's say I want to go to my music folder. So I could do CD, which stands for change directory, and music, DIR again. And it says that I don't really have anything in there. I've got a folder called video projects and that's about it. So there's some sort of like basic commands that you have to know. So you have to remember these off by heart. Now I don't use command prompt ever. I don't really need to, except when I'm doing something really, really technical, which I'm usually using like a YouTube guide or a website to help me. So like things like, like echo hello world, because what you can do with command prompts, you can make things called batch files. Now these batch files are essentially programs that use all these commands that could do jobs for you. So your technicians in schools and technicians in offices will probably use batch files if you're using Windows to go ahead and um, pre-do things for them automatically. So like installing things and whatnot, they'll use um, a batch file but as I've said all these commands you've got to remember these off by heart so you actually have to know all these commands if you're going to use this well so if you're like a, a network technician you'll know all the things like how you flush your DNS and 
how you do like IP config and stuff like that. Whereas I'm not a network technician, I'm not an expert, so I wouldn't know how to do that. So I have to look it up. So if you're not very technical, you're not very used to using command prompts mm -hmm. or using the commands in the command line interface, then you're not going to be able to do your job very quickly. And that's why we have the graphical user interface instead, because that's a little bit easier for people who aren't as good at computers um, to use. However, you can't do as as detailed things, as more technical things as you could in a CLI. Now, a summary of the CLI. So, some people, for some things, um, it's actually quicker to type out a command than go into, say, say you uninstall a program, and you've got a batch script you've written that does that for you, and you can just type out, you know, uninstall, and then the path name, that could be faster than going to add or remove programs, finding the program, press uninstall. Now, certain commands can be quick because we can use shortcut keys. Um, little memory and processing power needed because it doesn't have to do as much work. It's displaying text, that doesn't take up a lot of uh, memory. It doesn't require a lot of storage space because there's no graphical images and menus to store. And if you've memorized how to use all the commands, then it's very quick to use. However, if you've never used a command line interface before, it's very confusing and difficult to use. You've got to type commands precisely. If you spell something wrong, so even if you do DIR, for example, and you put um, DI with a capital R, that might not work. If you put um, DR by accident, it's not gonna work. There's a lot of commands to learn. You can't just think, you can't just guess stuff, and it's not suitable for someone new to that interface or new to that computer. Now, another type of graphical interface is what's called menu driven. So this is on the very first sort of iPod and things, like old MP3 players, where it allows you to interact with the computer through a series of menus. So you see on the little picture of the iPod, you've got playlist, browse, extra settings and whatnot. When you click on something, another menu pops up, another menu, and that allows you to work through a series of these menus to do what you want to do. But there's no icons, there's only menus, there's no windows, there's no pointers. Now, the good thing about a menu-driven interface, if you don't have to learn any commands, it's easy to understand and navigate, and everything's in a logical place, so it's pretty easy to figure out. You don't need to know lots of things, and it doesn't take a lot of processing power. However, if you've got loads and loads of menus, it's irritating, it's boring, it can take a long time, and it can be a long process to get, say you clicked one thing you want, you need to get back to the start. If you've got to go all the way back through these menus, that can be quite long and tedious. Now another type of um, interface is a touchscreen. So all your commands are input by touching the screen with your finger or a pen. Now you can do things like pinching to zoom in, swiping, lots of different quite sort of natural movements you can do to interact with a computer which can be a lot more, um, a lot easier to go ahead and complete tasks quite quickly. You'll see like a lot of children are much better on um, phones and tablets now because they're quite intuitive. The icons are nice and big so you can press it and you can be quite clumsy. Swiping is quite natural to do. Um, you know, tilting the screen and things like that. It's all quite easy to figure out as a child compared to if you sat them in front of a computer with a mouse and keyboard, they might not be able to use it as effectively. So it's very intuitive. It's easy to use, so you can just simply touch what you want to see on the screen. You don't have to use a mouse, you can just click on a button. Uh, you don't really have to think, and it's just really easy to learn and use, and it's easier for hand-eye coordination than keyboards and mics. If you've got a really fast mouse or a brand new mouse, sometimes you struggle to click on things. If you can just press it with your finger, it's a lot easier. But your screen can get damaged and scratched really easily. Dirty screens are an issue. They'll carry a lot of gems and things. Um, you need to be next to the device so you can touch it. Sometimes, if you are trying to use a desktop menu on a touch device, it's quite hard. So say if a website is not optimised for a phone or tablet, to select small items can be very difficult. Now, I know one thing I struggle with when I'm using my Surface Pen is that my sort of hand gets in the way when I'm trying to draw and I sort of touch things by accident. And some reduction in brightness may occur. Now, another type of interface is voice driven interfaces or voice recognition. So that allows us to issue commands and enter data by talking. Now, they're not the best at the moment, but you've things like Google Home, Amazon, your Xbox and things like that, it's really easy just to say, all right, Alexa, play this song or 
Okay, Google, turn the volume up. But where else could we use voice controls? Well, let's think is if you're thinking about someone who maybe have a disability who can't use the mouse and keyboard, being able to talk into the computer is very useful. Um, one, uh, my old car, which it wasn't a particularly brand new car, it wasn't um, like a Tesla or anything like that, it was just a Ford Focus, but I could use voice commands to um, pick a destination. I could say, right, um, guide me to home, and I'd have a preset um, address in there, and it would uh, bring up my sat nav and take me home. You think about your Xbox, you can say Xbox record that, and that goes and record the last thing you did in the game. It makes life a lot easier, especially when you can use your hands. So when you're driving, you know, it sort of reduces the amount of danger that can occur by you clicking a screen and things like that. However, the language is a little bit of an issue as well. So using natural language, obviously people have different dialects. As you can all hear, my accent is a lot different from somebody who is from London or someone from down south. So even when I used to have an Alexa, sometimes it couldn't understand what I was saying because I either spoke too quickly or I used a word I didn't understand or it couldn't understand my accent. So until I sort of fixed that gap of understanding lots of different dialects, we're still a little bit way off where we want to be with voice controlled interfaces. Now the benefits is that it's much faster to talk than it is to type. You don't need to learn how to type quickly or anything like that. You're not going to get any health and safety issues like RSI. You're not going to typo anything. You can, you've got more room on a desk, you just do it out of a keyboard. Disabilities are a lot easier to deal with because you can just use speech input. You can multitask if you're using a hands-free device and people find it more natural talking than typing. However, background noise can affect speech. If you've got a speech impediment, or sore throat, cold or a strong accent can't be understood. If you've got a disability that prevents speech, then you won't be able to use it. And it's difficult to keep data private. If I'm trying to type something private and I'm talking to the screen, they're gonna hear it. And if you've got a word such as two and two, they're two different words, but it might not understand it quite as you want, so you've got to go back and delete the word or whatever it is. Right, so that's pretty much everything you need to know about interfaces. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, one thing you can do is if you are bored and you want something a little bit extra work to do, if you want to look at learning some commands in CLI, that's quite useful to do. Maybe you want to find, um, you could even install Linux and have a practice with a different operating system. It is quite interesting, so make sure you are um, going ahead and doing that and getting a bit of extra learning. Please like and subscribe to the video, and I will see you in the next one.